All right, forensic students, today we are talking about arson. And um, so we're not just talking about fires, but we're talking about fires burning as potential criminal activity. So before we get started, I want you to do this. I want you to research the Cameron Todd Willingham case. So take a few minutes, do an internet search over this case, very, very interesting case. So Cameron Todd Willingham was a man who was convicted of killing his three daughters. Um, they, they burned in a fire um, and he was convicted of their deaths. Not only that, but he was executed. And um, later, investigators, arson investigators, came back and re-examined some of the evidence from the case. And uh, they determined that maybe he should not have been convicted that it they don't they think it was an accidental fire uh, and that he did not deliberately set the fire that killed his daughter. So take a few minutes to research this case. There is a video on YouTube, so let me show you. Um, if you'll not line produced it, um, if you'll just type in YouTube, not line the wrongful conviction of Cameron Todd Willingham. There's a nine minute video that it's very interesting. Um, it shows his three daughters, the ones that died in the fire, um, and sort of his story about how he was convicted, why he was convicted, and what arson investigators know now about the case. So take a few seconds, pause the video, jump over, do some, um, do some investigation on your own, and then come back and we'll learn all about arson. Right, so if a fire leads to suspicions that it was deliberately set, then an arson investigator is gonna be called in. So arson is the criminal act of deliberately setting a fire. And an arson investigator is a highly trained individual that's gonna be able to use his or her skills to determine if a crime was committed. So if there's any suspicions, then an arson investigator is called in. Now they're gonna start by making preliminary scene assessments, and then they're gonna start looking for the point of origin, and I'll show you that, um, how they determine that in a, a future slide. Now, their jobs are really tough because fires are destructive. So in a typical crime scene, investigators get there, they work the crime scene, they look for evidence. An arson investigator, not only do they have to find evidence, but they have to do so after a fire, which has pretty much destroyed everything in its path. Not only do they destroy, the fires destroy the potential crime scene, but when uh, firefighters put out these fires with largest largest, large amounts of water, it often washes away any evidence that was spared by the fire. So arson investigators have a really tough job, and their goal is to detect and identify chemical materials, uh, igniters that could have been used to create a fire, um, and then reconstruct the events that may have led to a fire. Now, there are three requirements that have to be satisfied in order to have a fire and to sustain a fire through combustion. So you have to have a fuel present. You got to have oxygen and not just oxygen in small amounts. It has to be available in sufficient quantities to combine with the fuel to actually create and sustain the fire. And then you also have to have heat. The problem with the heat component is fires will, once they reach combustion, will actually generate enough heat that it self-sustains. Uh, so that's why fires are so dangerous. So fire is actually a chemical process. It's a chemical reaction. Um, it is the product of oxygen combined with another substance. So it can be an accelerant and it will produce light and heat. And this whole process is known as oxidation. It's called oxidation because you can see here the oxygen is present in the chemical reaction. So when you have a rapid combination of oxygen and this, these other substances, you have what's called combustion. So when all that happens quickly, when they combine, you have combustion. Now once combustion begins, you can see in this picture, you're going to have enough heat 
that is going to be liberated to keep the chemical reaction going by itself. So fires are self-sustaining. They create a chain reaction where they produce enough, um, enough oxygen, enough heat to generate the chain reaction to keep itself going. Now, arson investigators, when they get to a crime scene, they're going to first survey the overall scene, but then they're going to start pretty quickly searching for the point of origin. So the point of origin is where the fire began. Now, if you talk to a trained arson investigator, they're going to tell you that this V pattern um, is not always going to be a perfect V. Sometimes it's an inverted V, but investigators know this. Uh, they know what they're doing. They're highly trained. But for us as forensic students, the most common burn pattern is called the V pattern. So investigators are going to be looking for this V pattern um, of char and soot that's going to lead them to the point of origin for the fire. And then they can start their investigation there. So you can see here in this animation or this image that when a fire burns, it's going to search for oxygen by moving upward. And once it reaches its um, the point where it can't move upward anymore, it's going to start to move out. So you can see in this picture here, the fire starts to burn upward. And then once it can't move up anymore, it starts to burn out. And so investigators are going to look for this V pattern to tell them where the fire started. And then they're going to be able to go from there. They can test for accelerant. They can look for pore patterns. Um, and they can just kind of uh, use their skills to determine more information. And once they determine the point of origin, they're going to focus their attention on accelerants and ign uh, ignition devices. So the way they test for accelerants is they most of the time will use something called a portable hydrocarbon detector that just tells them, hey, an accelerant was poured here. Um, they can also swab that area and send it off for analysis to determine if there is accelerant in a particular um, spot of the crime scene. Some uh, organizations have accelerant sniffing dogs. They can use those. And then investigators just kind of eyeball it. They're, they look for poor patterns and then they further test those poor patterns. Now, arson evidence has to be collected a little bit differently than regular crime scene evidence. It has to be protected because a lot of these accelerants are going to evaporate. So to prevent that loss of evidence, the specimens are collected and they're going to packaged in they're going to be packaged in airtight containers uh, so that the residues are kept safe, they don't evaporate. Now, why arson crimes? So at the time of this recording, the most common reason for arson crimes is insurance fraud. And then a second to that is crime scene concealment or crime concealment, uh, burning to hide something. Pyromania is number three and revenge is number four. Now the United States um, and individual state legal systems divide arson crimes into different degrees depending on a couple different factors, but for us and for simplicity's sake, we're just going to talk about it um, with regards to whether the, the structure was occupied or not. So typically, and this does depend on some different things, but typically first degree arson is going to be burning an occupied structure. So a daycare, a school, a home um, where people are normally present. Second degree arson crime is going to be burning an unoccupied building. So that could be like an empty barn or a house that's not occupied. Usually that is to claim insurance uh, on a property which would be insurance fraud, which is the number one reason for arson crimes. Third degree arson is going to be burning an abandoned building where the, there was no potential uh, reason for a person to be there. So a field, a forest, woods, typically where nobody's at. All right, that ends our arson lesson, and I will see you in the next video.